allowing me to be here to present my trip to Cuba. I didn't expect to do a presentation, but I do appreciate it nonetheless, and I hope you all appreciate the information as well. At the onset, I want to also say that I'm dedicating this presentation to the memory of my grandmother. Her name was Lillian Matilda Smith. She was born in Jos Van Dyck in 1910. She passed away in 2014. I would say that this picture was probably taken around, say, 1962 or 63, when she lived in New York at the time, as did we. And this picture was taken in 1995, March, when she had her 85th birthday. So we came back to St. Thomas to celebrate her birthday. So this is my grandmother. This is a picture of her with her son. My father is Bailey Richardson. And so we will be talking about Lillian Smith's grandfather. Growing up as children, we were always told that we had family in Cuba. And as a child, you get to understand your family relationships about grandparents and great aunts and so on. But we, I, you know, we were always aware that we had family in Cuba. And then as I got older, we'd hear the names, you know, of, you know, I would ask my grandmother, well, what, you know, what's your father's name? Because he would have left when she was young. And she said his name was Ebenezer Smith. And like you know, Mr. Seward mentioned earlier, a lot of people migrated from different islands, whether it's Jamaica to work on the Panama Canal, or from clearly the British Virgin Islands to work in Cuba, to work on the sugarcane plantations, or whatever. So apparently, Ebenezer Smith left from Tortola, where he's from Cane Garden Bay, to go to live in Cuba. And in the information that I had been aware of, he had left with a young daughter and her name was Doris, and that was kind of like all the information I knew. Well, in 1995, when I came back home to celebrate our grandmother's birthday, my cousins and I, and I would sit and talk with her all the time, she had said that, well, I have two letters from my sister Doris. So I said, well, can I see these letters? And I have them with me today, um, if you don't mind, some artifacts of the actual letter that she allowed me to have. And there were two letters that she had from her sister. It was dated 19, the, the last of the letters, and this is the envelope, the original letter, dated 1966, uh, May 27. And it's from Doris Smith, Marty number 31, Moron, Provencio de Camagui, in Cuba. And so again, now I know that there's a place in Cuba that I need to be thinking about where this family might be. And of course, it was written to my grandmother, Lillian Smith, and at the time, she was living in Brooklyn, New York. And in the letter, she had two pictures. That's the letter there. But she had two pictures. The first picture was of a young girl. And on the back of the letter, thank God, there was information on the back of the letter that says, with love to aunts and cousins from Celia Diana Benton Court on her fifth birthday. And the way that the date was written for the letter was written actually in the American style, not the month, day, year, but the not the year, month, day, but the month, day, year, 10, which is October 2nd, 1963. Now, my father was born in 1935, and here it is, he has a cousin that's born, you know, 1959, 1958. I'm thinking, well, how, you know, this whole age transition, that this is a really young cousin, and in my knowing of myself, I'm realizing that this person is an age that's within, like, my grasp of age reach, which was something exciting to know. She would be alive, would still be young, or what have you. But that was one of the letters. The second uh, pho photograph was another picture with Celia, and it says, with our best wishes to Lillian and family from Doris, so this is my great aunt Doris, Ramon, which is her husband, Bentoncourt, and Celia on her sixth birthday, and that was taken in October 2nd of 1964. Again, exciting information. <clears throat> this is a little map of Cuba that I put up because I'm thinking about where is Camagui, Camagui in relation Camagui. to everything else. And when I explain to people about like what Cuba looks like, I always try to reference it like a shark. I would say that the tail of the shark kind of is closer to Miami, Florida. The mouth of the shark is closer to Hispaniola and the rest of our Caribbean sisters and brothers. And then the fin of the shark would be in the central area. So from this map, just a you know, primitive map, this is Camagui area, which is where this was a big region at one point in time. And then where they are in Moron is in Ciego, uh, Ciego de Avila now. And I found that out because I work at Social Security here in St. Thomas. I came back about two years ago. And we meet everybody on the island. If a baby is born, 
the parent comes to Social Security, they get a Social Security number. If a person dies, we have the death information, we have to plug into Social Security for benefits. And everybody in between <laughs> wanting to come to the United States from Cuba, from Haiti, from Dominican Republic, trying to get a Social Security card to work. So on this particular day in October of 2014, a customer from Hemingway, Cuba came to the office and I happened to take care of his information and I was sharing with him that I may have some family in Kamigui. And he says to me, well, I can help you find your family. <laughs> and I said, really, would you, know, would you do that you know, with all the rules? And he said, yeah, I can try to find your family. He says, your family, you're seeing your family from Kamigui. And I, I mentioned Moron. He said, Moron is actually in part of Ciego de Avila now. It's not Kamigui anymore. They split that province in two. So I provided him with Celia Dianis, first and middle name, no last name, because I don't want somebody claiming to be my family, just enough information that way they can try to expand on that and find that this is the real person. So he looked up the family and a month later in November of 2014, he said he found my family. I found your family in Cuba, I said, oh my goodness. And then we've been exchanging email information and communicating that way for a year until my visit here in June 2016. Again, this is that same map of Cuba. This would be Camagüey here. This is Ciego de Avila, and this yellow dot represents Moron. And it's a rural town within Cuba. This would be over where Havana is, this little spot over here. And now there are a lot of flights going back and forth to Havana and or Santiago de Cuba, etc. In my particular case, I just wanted to see the family, wanted to meet them, so I went over to one of the websites that they also used, um, I believe it's here, you know, Cuba Travel Services. I'm not sure if it shows. Okay, it doesn't show. But I just went to Cuba Travel Services, looked up the information for, for the trip, and booked my flight to coming. We directly from St. Thomas to Miami, Florida. I stayed overnight and then went from coming away to, from, from Miami to coming away. Now, when I was doing the reservation, I asked my cousin, I said to him, how, since I'm thinking Camagüey and Moron is within the same area, I said, well, how far of a trip is it? How long of a distance? 25 minutes, 30 minutes, because I'm thinking it's a suburb. He says two hours. Mm -hmm. So I'm realizing, oh, this is a two hour trip that I've got to take. You know, I need to get a taxi. And they made a, an arrangement for me to get a taxi to and from the airport in Camagüey to Moron. And they also have some of the little rooms that people are able to rent, that the government allows them to rent to, to visitors. And I was able to make my reservation right around the corner from where they actually live. Let's see, give me one second. You're good, you're good. Okay. I'm trying to get the slide. Yeah, you just ended up swimming or something. Somebody in the water. Okay, whenever I go to a place to travel, I like to be able to see the landscape. I look like to look at the flora and fauna of the place. So this is from my airplane ride from Miami to Cuba. And you see there's a lot of farmland and a lot of vast area. And when I think about this view, I think about when I used to live in Ohio and would drive across to Illinois or to Kansas. And <clears throat> these fields and miles and miles of corn or other types of crops. <laughs> well, here it just shows that it's a lot of field, but it's not really, culti you know, not a whole lot of cultivation. <laughs> But this soil seems really rich, really fertile. Of course, it's in the Caribbean area, obviously. This is at the Camagüey Airport. It was probably about a two, two and a half hour flight from Miami to where I needed to be. The airport in its size is about the similar, a little bit smaller than the St. Thomas Early King Airport. And I would say that getting through customs and immigration was actually easier than traveling from St. Thomas to Totola, to be honest with you. I had my passport. I went to Cuba Travel Services. They made, I filled out the information and they prepared my visa when I left from Miami. It was $85. And when I got to Camagüey, they asked me in Spanish, do hablas espanol? I said, 
muy poquito y muy malo, like very bad and very little. <laughs> so the gentleman asked me in English, have I ever been to a country that had Ebola? Have I been in touch with anybody that had Ebola? I said no to th those questions. What is the purpose for my visit? I told him to visit my family. And then he took me to another immigration officer that asked me if I speak Spanish. I said very little, very badly. And he proceeded to speak to me in Spanish, asking me my name, where I'm from, who am I visiting in Cuba. And apparently there was a little bit of a discrepancy with the visa that I had. I had a visitor's visa, but in the paperwork that I filled out, I said I wanted to visit my family so they could have prepared a family visa. And he just mentioned that well, you should have, they should have prepared your family visa, but we can't prepare it until Tuesday because we're celebrating the revolution and Fidel Castro. But he put familia on my visa and sent me on my way. So I get out to the airport terminal, and when I was processing and getting my information from my luggage, I heard some cheering outside, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, is this like, you know, like, who's a rock star? Who's coming to visit? And my cousin told me that there was another flight coming in from the United States. It was a couple of hours late. So the family members in anticipation waiting for these people, when they finally got through, they were like so elated. But I get to the airport out there, to the terminal, and you know, you see a few cars, people are just waiting in the fringes. But as I get out, I hear my name, Stephanie, Stephanie, and my cousin Celia decided to write on the taxi, and she met me with my sign saying, Stephanie, I am Celia. <laughs> But of course I heard her, and of course it was a good 10 minute hugging and crying, and she's speaking totally in Spanish She's about how happy she is to have the me family come from the Virgin Islands, and wow. she's so happy and so joyous and excited and just speaking in Spanish and just, just really thoroughly thrilled as am I. And on the phone she's talking to her son Rodolfo who speaks English, so she's trying to tell him, tell her I'm happy, to, and I'm like, I know, I can tell. <laughs> Thank you, actually you're happy to have me here, as I'm happy wow. to have you there as well. These are just some pictures on the road. I would say that their freeway or the road to and from Camagüey to Ciego de Avila Moron, the size of the road is similar to the size of the waterfront, essentially. <coughs> and there are no, there were few lines to show left, right side mm -hmm. driving. Some of the infrastructure is somewhat poor, so we have to slow down to, for some of the dirt portions of the road. They drive without you know, rear view mirrors, which I'm sure couldn't happen at the same time. <laughs> And again, just some road. I li I like, again, I like to look at some of the foliage and the land. It's very, very flat, and it was a very flat drive. Could not see a hill in sight mm -hmm. on the two-hour drive from Camagüey to the Ciego de Avila. A couple of times, the taxi driver said, "You know, driving is muy peligroso. It's very dangerous <coughs> because on this particular case, and this is on the journey back, but in this case, you would see some horses or some cows. This particular cow just broke away." And he was like running on side of the car next to us. And I'm thinking, please don't let me run into the car. And then in my mind, I kept thinking, well, where are the farmers for the cows? A couple of times, a couple of goats try to run out on the street. And I'm thinking, well, where are the farmers for the goats or the, the livestock? This here shows these white things are bags of rice. They were cultivating rice that day. And so when they harvest the rice, they put them in the bags. and so. It was all along the freeway, and they were getting ready to, I guess, put it into the plant to get it sorted for wherever it was going to be sent and distributed. Again, just a lot of flat land there. I'm not sure what that particular crop is, but on this side, you'll see a lot, a lot of sugar cane. A lot of sugar cane that was there. And I'll share more about getting to talk to the family later on. Again, a lot of flat land, motorcycle, but not a whole lot of cars on the road, obviously. This is another little village on the way to Kamui, and you can't see it, but this is a train track. And then on the opposite side, of course, is another smaller village just outside of Kamui. So I get into Moron, and I guess they were known for cockfighting back once upon a time. I don't know if it's illegal now or not, clearly not as popular, but it was known for that this big rooster that sits in their city. These next few pictures will be on the actual Cayo on the street where my cousin's <coughs> house is in Moron. And again, you'll notice that this, again, a smaller street, narrower street, one of those old vintage Chevys that's there. But you'll see in the distance those bicycle taxis. I would say that the bulk of the transportation is a bicycle or bicycle taxis. And for me, when I rode in the bicycle taxis, I felt I was putting my life in danger every time that I was in it. Just my experiences. But another bicycle taxi, a lot of people ride bicycles. Doesn't matter what age, 
you're going up the street, down the street, there's no left, no right, just however you get to where you need to go is how they travel. At one, at one point, one of the days, I saw a woman with a baby that was kind of straddled in the front, and the baby had to be 12, uh, less than 12 months old, maybe 10 month old baby. And they're riding up and down, whereas, you know, of course, in the state, you have all these rules and laws of strapping in your child where they just do it regularly. You get on the road, bicycles next to tractors. It doesn't really matter, there's a car in the distance. Next picture, they have a lot of the horse and buggy carriages on the same road with people on bicycles and motorcycles. And that was, I, I said, Louis, and it, it, me, interesante, it was very interesting to me. And when I mentioned about the bicycle taxi, I was on my way back from getting some things from the grocery store, and all of a sudden I'm hearing horse hoofs getting closer and closer, and apparently one of the horses, I guess, got spooked with something behind it and was almost out of control and almost ran into the back of my bicycle taxi. Wow. But the driver veered it off into the sidewalk. So could you imagine somebody on the sidewalk seeing a horse coming at them too? Muy peligroso. Again, the bicycle taxis and motorcycles. A lot of the houses are like rural houses. They're all connected to each other. And if you look at some of the rooftops, they don't have a lot of galvanized roofing like how we have here in St. Thomas. It's a lot of this, I don't know if this is old German or what have you, but just this stuff type Spanish, Spanish, Spanish style, yeah. style roofing, and they're very, very old. 60, 70, 80, 90 year old roofing, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the infrastructure. This is my cousin's house, and again, a very old roof, and a lot of signs you'll see with a cardboard box just saying, you know, home for sale. Mm -hmm. They're trying now with, I guess, this new American-US connection, trying to go to places where they believe they can have more economic independence versus where they are. Speaking of the economic independence, my cousin actually is a professor of pedagogy at the university within Moron. And she was saying, I, I would say that they pay the people, their professors, their doctors, get paid in what I will reference as monopoly money. So let's say, for example, you give monopoly money value where a person can spend this monopoly money. The internal money is $25 to one Cuban peso. The Cuban peso is on par with the American dollar. So my cousin's monthly salary may say, for example, be say $700 a month in the internal monopoly money. But if you translate that into American dollars, that might be less than what, $100, $70 a month. But that's how they get paid. And so as a result, they're not able to, you know, they're, they're, the food is rationed obviously, but they're not a, a, a able to afford a majority of luxuries and things that we take for granted here in our community because they don't get paid in the way that you would say would compensate them for the value and for what they can provide. But that's, that's our perspective, obviously. But these are more, this is some more uh, pictures of the road there, the streets, and the infrastructure. Again, yeah, summertime's really hot. Kids sitting out there laying on the sidewalk, playing, you know, kickball, and this guy apparently is the coach. He's directing them from the side. Next picture showed that what, you know, what Caribbean island doesn't have dominoes? And so these gentlemen are just playing dominoes on this particular afternoon. This is a restaurant called La Buna de la Leche de Moron. And the water is not clearly as bright as the Virgin Islands, but my cousin was explaining to me that the sugarcane plants, when they would have some of the runoff from the sugarcane plants, it changed the color of the water, and some of the sediment just settled on the sand, and so that's why the color of the water is not as blue as you have here in the VI. Again, it's, this is how it sits off the water there, a lot of catfish. And again, this is my cousin Celia. This is her husband, Rodolfo Sr., and this is her husband, Rodolfino Jr. Again, she's a professor. She has actually her degree in, um, uh, she has two degrees, actually. He has two degrees in hospitality management and law, but he works as a waiter at a hotel, a senior waiter at a hotel, because he gets paid at the Cuba pesos, the reality, realidad money versus the monopoly money in his tips. And then her husband's a mechanic for some of the bicycles. His last name is Skeet, and he believes his family may be from St. Vincent, actually. Skeet. Mm -hmm. And we're there at the restaurant again. When the, when the bill came and we had each full two-course meal, beverages, clearly, I, they made sure I got the bottled water. But at the end, in their Cuban internal money, the bill was roughly about 700, 
I'm sorry, uh, close to about 32, 33 American dollars or Cuban pesos, which would be probably about, I guess, $600, $700. So my, she was explaining to me it would take a month of my salary oh, exactly. to have paid for the meal that we just ate. Oh and in knowing that, it also made me understand that the people that are serving us, the waiters and waitresses and people cooking the food, even though they're serving us food that, we're able to, that I'm able to eat or we're able to eat, they are eating on ration food and they can hardly pay for the food that they're serving to people that come there as guests. So it was just, you know, muy interesante was a word that I used over and over again, just the disparity in service and have and need and so on in the, in the community. I told my cousin before I got there by email that I want to do whatever she does, wherever she goes, I want to go, I want to see what she does. She teaches at a university close by here, but it's a medical school that she teaches at, and this is a 3,000 bed hospital that's there in the community. So again, it's free health, free education obviously, and they provide for the people. But I would say that the hospital, in terms of the quality and on the inside, because she let she says, let's go on the inside. You know, it's not the most, I mean, it's a wide area in the, in the lobby, but some of the areas weren't as sanitary as it could have been for a hospital. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a public hospital. When you went into the hall, in the next picture you'll see, they had different rooms for, like if you have a head injury, or you broke your arm, or you broke your foot, or you hit your, hurt your wrist, there's a specific room for to be treated for that particular ailment, ailment or malady. A few blocks away, we went to where she teaches, and I would say the school or the university that she teaches at, of course, has a lot of people visiting from all these other countries in Europe because they don't have an, an embargo against Cuba. But this is a picture of the university president. This is their national song, their national seal, their flag, and the national bird of Cuba, and that sits prominently in the lobby of the school of the university, obviously. When we went through the lobby, because it was a holiday, it was closed. So my cousin took her credentials with her and asked if we could go in, and she didn't say I was from the U.S. In fact, her son was saying, don't talk, you know. <laughs> but they let us in, and they said no pictures. You know, no matter who I was, they didn't want pictures. But I was able to sneak a picture in, and I was able to get a picture of my cousin Sally and her son Rodolfo, and then myself with my cousin, and behind there, of course, are the administrative offices for their university. This is at Celia's house, and we were, you know, again, I just wanted to do whatever they did. She kept apologizing for the state of her home and everything, but I said, I'm here to see you. I don't care about the house and all of these material things that you're thinking about. I just want to be able to touch the hand of my cousin after this promise that I'd made to my grandmother since 1995, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we're just sitting there playing a game of cards called El Presidente. Mm -hmm. And of course me, my, my cousin Sandy, her husband, her son, and that's just a neighbor, Michelle, who works at the hotel from time to time. This, in her back, in her back area of her kitchen, she has like a back small covered area and then there are two trees in the backyard, a mango tree and a guanabana tree, which is a sour sap tree. <laughs> And I'll explain that in a few moments, but she has two dogs. This dog gave me the stink eye the whole time, so he never came close to me. But ironically, this dog was friendly, and the dog's name is Friend. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the ironic thing to that. But with the tree, with the Sawasa tree and the mango tree, while I was there, she had offered me some tea. And you could tell that the tea came from one of the hotels that they had for me to have. And so I said to her, well, why don't you all just drink the leaves, drink the tea, make tea out of the leaves of the tree? And she was just amazed that I could even do that. And she said, well, what do you do? I said, well, just pull off a couple of leaves. And they were like, well, how much do I put off? You know, I said, just got a good handful. And I said, just wash it off. They put it in a little tin pot. And she was, well, how much do I boil it? Well, this is enough. And we had some bush tea, and I said, this is a normal thing in St. Thomas, and she seemed totally shocked and surprised. I said, you don't have to get the tea from the hotel or wherever you're buying it from. Just get the tea leaves, wash it off, make yourself some tea. And, and, and so that was quite interesting um, to her. Very, very interesting and shocking to her. I don't know if you can see clearly, but this was a huge thing. I thought it was a bat coming, bat coming through the house, but it's a giant moth. Our butterfly, moth or butterfly is huge. It, it, it was huge. I was like, oh. And he caught it. So God bless him. <laughs> this is a picture of the 
This is the, um, okay. her name is Lady Laura. She is the woman that runs the house that I stayed at. It was for 25 Cuban pesos every day. And she actually is also a professor, but she stopped being a professor to get paid that monopoly money. And so now she runs the hotel full time and charges people in the Cuban pesos. And you get it absolutely, absolutely. And she's had visitors from Romania, from Germany, Canada that have come through her home. And she says they don't really get to see the real. She says, Stephanie, you're getting to see the real Cuba. Not far from where they are in Moron, there's a piece of a stretch of little islands where they have like a five-star hotel, Kaya Coco, and that's where a lot of the tourists come to stay. Mm -hmm. And it's about a 45 minute, one hour ride away from the main area where I was. And so the people stay there and that's what they see and they believe that to be Cuba, yeah. where the hotels provide them with mm -hmm. eggs and potato salad or whatever it is. But on the economy, they don't have <coughs> those things. This is the whole hallway to the kitchen area. <coughs> These are my room accommodations, fairly modern, fairly nice. You know, the bathroom area, really, again, modern. And every day that I got there, she put a little flower from her garden there for me. And again, the meal. I, they, I'll tell you my tomato and potato story. I stayed there for a week. And on the last two days before I left, I said, I'd like to prepare something for you all. And I said, I'm just going to make some chicken noodle soup. I'm thinking it's basic, it's easy to fix. And so they were like, well, her, her son Rodolfo was asking me, what do you need for your chicken noodle soup? I said, well, you know, of course, chicken noodles, you know, tomato, potato, celery. Well, I couldn't finish saying celery and get potato up because he started laughing. And he says, you're not gonna get that hair like that. And I says, why not? And he says, because we really don't have it like that. I said, but you will have all this land that you can grow your own tomatoes. He said, the land belongs to the government and so the people's attitude is why grow potatoes if it belongs to the government? Let them provide it to us. And so they don't grow potatoes they, themselves, the government really doesn't do it. It's all imported from the countries where they have connections with, whether it's Canada or Spain, whatever. And they have it at the hotel for the tourists. But the people on the economy, they don't normally have the markets like that as we would have in Market Square to be able to get these tomatoes or celery and those kinds of things. So uh, he said, well, I'll try to get your potato. And it took him four days to get me a potato from the hotel. So I made my potato, so, the, so you, somebody asked what would they eat. I mean, they would have chicken, obviously, mm -hmm. and rice, but they won't have the vegetables and the seasonings like that, like how we would have it here as such. Uh, but this, she was able, her husband, this woman's husband works at the hotel as a supervisor, so he was able to get some tomatoes or what have you out, pass the guard and pay them off. Yeah, <laughs> right. Tomatoes, celery, a little bit of chicken, uh, boiled plantains, and then plantain chips. Was the, was the dinner for that day, or for the lunch for that day. I'm gonna share with you again the family connection. Again, I said earlier that I always was aware you know, that we had family in Cuba, and so I assume that, I know my Aunt Alice is my grandmother's older sister. She's a twin, Alma Smith, and then my grandmother Lillian is a third of his children. What I found out through a letter was, my grandfather's name was actually Thomas Ebenezer Smith, and I would suspect that he was born around 1878 or so. His first of his children would have to be my Aunt Alice and Aunt Alma, who were born around 1907, and they were born in Tortola. And my Aunt Alice has 10 children born between St. Thomas, Florida, and New York. The third of the children, after the twins, would be my grandmother Lillian Smith, who was born in Joseph Van Dyke, and my granny was born in 1910. And her children, of course, are my four, you know, my, my, grandma, my aunt, Beryl, my father, Bingley, Aunt Leona, Aunt Marisha, and my dad has seven children and me. The third of the children that I found out was actually my aunt, and my aunt Dora and Emma. My aunt Dora was, should have been born around 1912. My aunt Emma was born about 1913, and she's actually still alive, and she turned 103 years old this year. Oh, wow. But the family that we're dealing with and who I was able to meet was the Doris, uh, Doris. She actually was born in St. Thomas on May 23rd of 1917. So technically, she, was, she is a US citizen. Technically, and that's the only child that was born in St. Thomas. Then of the other children you have that are still alive, Ernesto, Josefina, and Manfred, who were actually born in Cuba. What I also found that he didn't just travel with his daughter, he had to have travel with these two children and Doris, and he left with his wife. Her name is Diana Pickering. 
So hence my cousin Celia's name is Celia Diana Bentoncourt Smith. So again, he left with his wife and she's a Pickering. Ernesto is still alive. I believe he should be 90 years old and Josefina is still alive and she should be 86. And Manfred has passed away. He passed away with no children. And me thinking I have a small family, even though I know my aunt Alice has 10 children, Dora has five children. Emma has nine children. I got to speak to one of them who's an engineer. Her name is Natividad. And Doris barely speaks any English. And of course, Ernesto has six children and Josefina has three children. And, I, and from my understanding, one of Josefina's children was able to get out of Cuba and should be living in Miami, Florida somewhere. And of course, you see, you know, when Daddy got elected to the Senate in 1986, that's all of us. We came for the inauguration ceremony. And this, of course, is Daddy and my grandmother with him. At the time, she should have been 76 or so. Mm -hmm. Celia was able to have a picture, and it's not the best picture here, but she was able to send me a picture of my, my great-grandfather. So this is Ebenezer Smith, who I gasped when I saw him because he looks like my grandmother. So it's like, you see this family connection, obviously. And this picture is of his wife, Diana Pickering. And she happened to have that picture, not the best quality, but picture at the house. This is a letter dated 1963 out of San Juan, Puerto Rico, because my Aunt Alice, like I said, she left from St. Thomas with some, of her, with some of her children here in St. Thomas, went to Puerto Rico, had some more children in Puerto Rico, and then left for the States, had children in the States. But she used to con communicate with Thomas Ebenezer Smith. That's how I was able to find that his name was Thomas Ebenezer Smith. And this says Oriente. So in the earlier map that I showed you with the blue and green regions, I believe one region would be considered Oriente, where Holguin and Santiago de Cuba and that area would be. I'm not sure about the middle areas. But they did say that a lot of the Enma and some of the other family ended up staying in Holguin in that area, whereas Doris and her family ended up migrating out to be in Camagüey and moving forward. This is my Aunt Doris. Her mother, Diana Pickering, sewed, so she herself also sewed as well. This is a picture I showed you earlier of her, her and her husband. This is my cousin Celia's birth certificate, and on there you'll see her full name of Moron and her birth date, which is written the other way, in Camagüey. Her father, Ramon Bentoncourt Moline, was actually from Montona, uh, Montonzas, Cuba, which was further west. And of course, they have the birthplace of her mother, Doris Smith, born in St. Thomas, East Las Virginias de los Estados Unidos. And I believe, oh yeah, this is a picture of Sally in high school, a senior as well. What a minute. Uh, huh? What do you mean? I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is a picture of her at her wedding with, of course, her husband, Rodolfo. This is her mother, uh, Aunt Doris, her father. And then this is his mother, and then his grandmother at the wedding and then this is them now I like you like you I got a few little St. Thomas because I didn't know what to take so I got a couple of sundresses I got them the little flip dolls the island flip dolls that I, my grandmother used to have in her house and she just loved that so she named one side Stephanie one side Celia <laughs> and of course my St. Thomas t-shirts for her husband and for her as well and then this is one of the last bits of communications from my actual Aunt Alice when she lived in Florida, writing to Moron Camagüey in Cuba. And when I explained to my cousin that I did try to write back in 1995 to communicate with them at the address that was given, I'd never heard anything and I felt badly when my grandmother passed away. And that having been able to have found the family at the time, she said they should have known Moron was part of where Moron was and that they didn't get it to them was, you know, shame on them. I believe that is all that I have in the way of my presentation today, but certainly I hope you all enjoyed it, and if you have any questions, feel free, but I enjoyed it. Stephanie, uh, Larry, this is a good time to ask mm -hmm. questions. Stephanie, how you doing? I'm great, how you great. doing? Great, I'm wonderful. Listen, I'm working on my book on centenarians, and I see that you called two persons, Lillian, mm -hmm. who was born in 1910, mm -hmm. and you said she, she died in 2014? Yes. Um, she was 94. No, she was, no, she, she, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2004, I'm sorry. No, that means she's 104. Mm -hmm. Oh, 2004. 2004. 2004. I'm sorry, yes. Okay, all right. So then she wouldn't get sent to her. Yes, all right. correct. 
Now the other one, mm. Emma. Emma. Uh -huh. Emma. Now she's the one who's 103. She's still alive. Right. She's still alive in Cuba. Can right. you give me some information on uh -huh. If any. I can try to. Where was she born? She was actually born in Tortola. Well, then she's good. Anybody that was born here and went away, or they were born somewhere else and came here, lived and died, they're being included. So okay. I can still include her. I mean, if you don't have as much information, if you have a picture, that would be great. If you don't, that's okay. But I just need information in terms of her name, mm -hmm. where she was born, mm -hmm. and when she was born, and that would suffice. You know, just for that, if you can't give me any more information. I will track it and contact cool. Sally and have her give that to me. I'll get it to you. Okay, Absolutely. Great. And I'll Absolutely. give you my number so that you can contact me. Sure, thank you. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Yes. In regards to what you call the monopoly money, is there a particular business or businesses that they are able to spend that money for the full value of it? No, the, the, the value of it will always be that monopoly money, so to speak. And so if you were to want to buy a shirt and the shirt were, they, whenever they have the pricing in the stores, they have it printed in the internal money and the Cuban peso money. So you will see something saying $400 or $12 and you pay whatever the money that you have. One of the days we did, I, I wanted to go, I, like I said, I wanted to do everything that she did. And so we went to a worship service. One of the days she said her mother was Baptist. And she said prior to the revolution or right after the revolution, they were not encouraged to go to churches or worship in any way, shape or form. But she said my mother still kept her Bible which was written in English and she continued to pray. And the people would say, well, you're crazy. Why are you praying? Why are you doing all of this, you know, you know stuff? But when she was able to go to a church, she went to like a Baptist worship service. So I went to a worship service there, and they had a fairly modern praise and worship service. They had met a message. People were involved in the congregation. When I left, we went to walk back to the house, but I said, let me get a couple of bottles of water. And when I went to the store, people were hanging out at the store. I just figured they were hanging out, so I was going to go in, pass them. And this old man closed the door, and he says, no, we could only let two people in at a time. You can't. I guess they want to make sure they see you and you're not stealing something. So it was really just super hot that day, and I just decided not to wait that day. But I went back later on in the week, and there were like about four people allowed in at a time to, to go in. So, I mean, they ration things. They don't have a whole lot of stuff with what they do have. In getting to make that chicken soup, and I made some Johnny cakes as well, or journey cakes, <laughs> I was able to, you know, the, the, the rice, I had, you know, beans and rice and chicken without the seasonings and plantains. And she put the rice, the dry rice out, and she spread it out, and she started sorting through the rice. And she asked me in Spanish, well, do you do that? And I says, no. And she said, well, how do you make rice? She's asking me in Spanish how I make rice in St. Thomas. I said, we just dump it out the bag and boil it, you know, rinse off the starch, and you boil it. She said, you have to look at the rice to make sure you're not cooking up, you know, the shucks or the pieces of the rice or dirt in your rice. The same exactly. with the sugar. Exactly. The sugar is so to me super sweet compared to the rice that we have here in the States, you know, or the sugar. Uh, the same with, um, you know, of course they had the mangoes and everything. The, the fruits are just so huge and so robust. In the mornings for breakfast, it took me four days to, four days to figure out the word for butter in my translation book. But I had mataki, and now I, now I know. It took me a while, but now I'll never forget it. But every day for, for breakfast, I would have like some bread and some eggs, and I would do it myself. But they would have like a kind of a drink, kind of like you would consider a smoothie. But it was really made with not really milk, but it was like a yogurt type of a beverage that they would fix. And that's kind of what they have for the breakfast every day, you know. So I'm hoping that she did, you know, she did enjoy the Johnny Cakes. We went to the store, like I was saying earlier, got the carrots, a small bottle of baby carrots what? for whatever it was. That was what I, my vegetable. They had lots of yucca, so that was available to, you know, to give it some substance for the soup. And my one potato, and I made some soup on the Johnny Cakes, like I said. And it was just wonderful. They're like, oh, you made the bread so fast. What do you, what, how do you do that? You know, it's just easy. You don't have to sit out there and buy bread all the time. You can actually just buy the flour and use it for what you want to use it for. So that was interesting for them to be able to do that and wonderful to have shared. Mm -hmm. You taught them how to make sauce. I hope you don't have them all sleeping. I just <laughs> <laughs> But just the idea, like I said, that yeah. they have this so a resource there that they don't know what to use it for or what it's for or what have you whereas that's one of my favorite teas i yeah. i love it for any time but 
Next time, tell them one leaf is sufficient. When, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. When, when I told them they could use it for several days. No, you make them back. <laughs> yeah, but, yes. Um, question, right? Uh, you mentioned the. No, no, no. Do they use the coup? The coup money, which is the official, the national money. They use their the internal money for whatever well, they need. That's, for. The, uh, and that's what she's talking about. She's saying, you mm -hmm. say the. Mm -hmm. The coup. The coup and the coup. Yeah. C-U-C, mm -hmm. C-U-P. Yeah. C-U-P is the, is the Cuban money. dollar. Right. Cuban, not, not, the, not the one that's equivalent mm -hmm. to the U.S. Correct. The Cuban internal dollar, yeah, the monopoly that's the money C, equivalent. That's the C-U-P. And the C-U-P is a Cuban peso, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so, yeah. 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 Very, and so very, her son was saying that, you know, he... You, they had a small little TV. He says, people here think that's a big deal. My parents have this TV, but his tips that he receives from the hotels that he gets is in the Cuban peso. So he's able to afford to buy a TV or a little hand washing machine for his mother and father because they can't afford to buy it on that internal money that they're getting paid. Now, we talk, I mentioned earlier about perspective, our perspective. I have some Cuban friends who, I, one of the parents would ask me all the time, did you ever get a hold of your family? Did you ever get a hold of your family? So I finally did and I saw her a few months ago. And she said that her daughter was saying, who's born in the U.S., saying, you know, oh, my cousin, one of the requirements for the free education that they have, and it's a good education that they have, they're required to work in the sugar cane fields for nine weeks out of the year, meaning during the course of their studies, there is a structure set in the sugar cane fields that they get their education for part of the day in the morning, and then later on in the day, they're working with the machetes to cut the sugar cane that's put on a truck to go ahead and take to be processed. Now, you would think that's, oh, I, I wouldn't even break my back cutting, you know, sugar cane. But one of the things my, my friend had said, because she's Cuban, a Cuban of Cuban heritage, we think about the cost of tuition today. Some people are still in tons of debt for their education. My friend was saying, I'd gladly cut sugar cane for nine weeks to have, not have this debt weighing on my back for the rest of my life. I learned something today. I never knew that. I thought that free education was a free education. Correct, but, it's, yeah. but, but, but hey, yeah. it's not quite a thing. Yeah. If, if I may add, right, um, about a couple of years ago, you had students from the States going to Cuba to, to, to get educated. Mm -hmm. They had to, even though they were going back, mm -hmm. the stipulation was that they had to do a kind service. They couldn't charge. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, to, to explain this type of conditions that exist because most people would think that this, this is a fixed thing, mm -hmm. you see? So like I said, I mean, I, I said my trip, you know, even though it's a journey in the making, every time my cousin would ask me, well, what are your thoughts about Cuba, I would say, muy interesante. It's very interesting, just the experiences that you have versus what we, you know, take for granted here. And, you see, and you talk about the education. It's not necessarily free, but you're, you know, providing this extra service. This is your national crop, perhaps. And so why not be indulged and engaged in the production of this? And you see what it takes to get that. And at the same time, with, with, what, with the woman whose home I stayed at, she has a sister, sister that now lives in the mainland U.S., but she says her sister was a part of that free, you know, got the free education, and she was part of a program where she had to provide some type of physical therapy or support to, for her profession. Well, she didn't complete the program in Venezuela, I think is where she was, and she ended up getting paperwork to get to the United States. So now she's not allowed to go back to the United States for 10 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. So this is like oh, six years into her 10 years of not going back to, because she didn't complete the you program. Mean to Cuba? Cuba. To Cuba, sorry. Okay, okay, to okay, Cuba, okay. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And so that's as a result of her not doing what she was yeah. supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. She didn't comply. I have something to say. Look, you know, a lot of times we glorify, I hear people glorifying people of culture, right? but it seems to me like the people of Cuba used to live a better life, Arlo. And uh, Batista, no way. Than, 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 than Fidel. Than Fidel. Mm -hmm. Fidel. No way. You know. No way. Because you know, the United States were pumping money to Cuba. Although they were being exploited under Batista, but 
you know, Different. I'm in the revolution, you know. It's it's just, it, it, I mean, like, <laughs> like I told you, it, I had to be a casual or almost worse than what these people But when you think about it in that perspective, you can say that yeah. some of the doors, because that weekend I couldn't get that family visa, so they yeah. wrote it on there. But I saw some stores saying, Viva Fidel and Ramon. Yeah. And I said, well, why would they say, long live Fidel yeah. and Ramon, you know, when you're living with this internal monopoly money? And he said, he, my cousin would say, well, maybe the people just want them to think that they like them. I'm sure they don't, yeah. you know. To me, the best thing to I have to give up Fidel and Ramon, you need to die. His perspective, because he's born, he's born in the '80s, so he's born yeah. of that system. And I asked the woman who was home, we stayed at her son's going to medical school in his fifth year of the medical school. I asked him his perspective, and he says we we do feel like we live in a time capsule because we look at TV with the four channels that they do have. And see movies and see things at other places. And when the tourists like come to visit from Canada news. and these other places, how further ahead and all these yeah. other things they have technologically that we don't have. And the, he says, I go and vote every year, even though it's only one party, and nothing really changes. But I feel that somehow my way of saying I want to exercise my right to vote, in, in, in spite of the fact that I don't believe that my vote will really matter yeah. as such, with just this one party and the same person continues to get in. But we're hoping now with this new wave of American interest that perhaps things will change hopefully faster and better. That's that's the hope. Is there any fear? Did that end? Fear is, there too. is there any fear? I know you said that they're hoping that things get better, but is there a bit of fear that think their way of life has been new and to them? Not at all. I think the young people are wanting for there to be a lot of change because they believe it's more good than any negative that could, you know, be of it. I think this is why they're very optimistic about the Obama yeah. mm -hmm. initiatives yeah. because they feel there is some hope. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, not as much hope as they would like to see. I think the progress is very slow. I think it's here. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, if I may, I think you should stress that you are in Kamagoy, mm -hmm. and that's a rural area because it's not every well, place. Well, is very rural, and my cousin was telling what I'm saying she said, because she said the family that's in whole Yin, she says if you think we're rural but, you go she says when we went to Emma's for her 100th birthday they thought we were coming up from uptown that, that, <laughs> but that's that's my point but because if you go to uh, Santiago all right <clears throat> it's a different you got to stress if I may, mm -hmm. yeah, that you were in a rural area because mm -hmm. in many places, rural areas, even in the U.S., mm -hmm. hey, mm -hmm. you rural area like backwards too. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So you have to stress that. Mm -hmm. It's similar to uh, to a person uh, from St. Croix who went to to Cuba. They went to Havana, and all they stressed was a uh, toilet paper. Listen, we, we were here in Santiago, we didn't have that kind of condition. You have to stress where you are and the type of condition under which you live. Because who haven't been there, uh, they're going to take it as gospel. Mm -hmm. You follow where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. Get your hand up on Sophie. Sophie. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't know um, the Doris is, mm -hmm. is was the person who moved Correct. and, and the thing that, that's curious to me when people move my siblings have all moved my parents moved from St. Bart's here something of our culture or our way of life continues with the generations but I'm wondering what your cousin was able to tell you that her mother had told her about where she had come from which would have been the Virgin Islands or Tortola or St. Thomas if she knew if she was familiar with it at all and uh, no, what? I mean, her mother, of course, her parents spoke English, obviously, so she spoke English. She said that her mother, her grandmother, Diana Pickering, sewed, so her mother continued to sew. Her father, she, she said of my great-grandfather, she does remember him with when she was a little child, and she remembers him making a ha one time making a hammock for her, like she came to visit, or he came to visit, she had to be three, four, five, however old she was, and he was able to take a cloth and make a hammock for her between two trees as such. But not a whole lot of, you know, the, the Bush tea story got lost, I believe, in the translation for them that she would be so surprised that that's something that we do regularly here. 
So not, you know, other than just some of the crafts that she learned from her mother in terms of the heritage and the place and the landscape. She said her mother always talked about St. Thomas. And I saw her mother's birth certificate and she was baptized at the Methodist Church, Christ Church Methodist Church. So I told her that is still in existence and still standing. And my desire is to try to get her to come to St. Thomas. I was able to take on my laptop pictures of one, one of the days I was driving to work and I had it on my cell phone of like the route from waterfront all the way down past the legislature to this view center and so she saw all these cars whereas it's so rare and rare where she is in her area so she's you know, like i said i hope that they're able to get to visit under some special condition with the centennial organization one, one more question i have being, being like her mother who was from st thomas would st thomas american when um yeah, she was born at least a month and a half to two months after the so transfer. Is she approved that? She can. She, 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 she said that she has tried before, but they have denied her. And it's time they had that embargo. Yeah, I could explain some of that because uh, Larry's um, Larry's cousin asked me to look into that. Huh? Yeah. But you had your hand up a minute back there. You, you read that? I was hailing. Uh, well, let me just, uh, for example, Larry's cousin's uh, grandfather, Emilio, was born in the Danish West Indies, 19, whenever he was born, he was born in 1896 or something. So that uh, by the time he got to Cuba, uh, it was under the, um, it was before the transfer, but he was able to claim U.S. citizenship because the Danish and the American government had agreed that those who were Danish citizens had up until a certain time to claim U.S. citizenship. Mm -hmm. So his his that that uh, Emilio saw he, he did that. He claimed he claimed citizenship not only for himself but for his children. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that happened to be uh, he was his wife was not an American citizen mm -hmm. at the time that that if, uh, his son his son was born. So according to immigration record, according to immigration, they're saying because because both of them were not American citizens, mm -hmm. that citizenship couldn't be passed on to the son who was born in Cuba. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's what it said. Or the children, the children. See, so it's a little complicated. I had all the papers and the documents. And that's just because it's on the father's side. That was on the father's side. But the mother, uh, I think, uh, Emilio's wife was from St. Kitts. But uh, but his uh, but his kids were born in but his son's wife was born in Cuba. You see, uh, I always had a little chart, but explain that a little better. But but they had a little problem with the fact that that um, that both uh, spouses were not married and were not American citizens. So in this particular case, her family member left here an American citizen. Yeah, the other, she would yeah, exactly, and that's different too from uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, an uh, interesting. Point. So they don't have to Extra, claim extreme. now because when you leave as a Danish citizen, yeah. you have to claim. Right. Yeah. But when you leave as a U.S. citizen, yes, yeah. automatic. Yeah. And yeah. it should have been automatic. So she's claiming. Well, you can't claim without the status. Thank you. Permit me. I don't know. I want. I want to get to a little thing. I see some is Domingo or uh, Matbini. I want to yeah. talk about her. Mm -hmm her situation and her family situation. Sure. But I just want to thank you so much for your presentation and thank you to, to, uh, to answer any questions that you have.